Thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to uh, talk about today is partnerships. And I thought I'd say that first because uh, you mightn't realise that till I get the end of the talk that uh, that's what I'm actually talking about. It's about the importance of partnerships. Um, and by partnerships I mean what we just heard about uh, is happening here. Um, my argument is that we don't do enough of it. We don't work well enough together. Um, and uh, whilst it's, uh, it's very good here and I was pleased to hear a summary of what's actually happening, um, I want to say that we need a much bigger scale and we need to do it on a national scale in ways that we haven't before and you can't hear me over in the back corner and that's probably better, I hope. Otherwise, I'll stand in the middle. Um, so that's what I really want to talk about, uh, a national effort and how we might go about it. And basically say that I don't think that we um, do enough. Um, in some instances, I don't think we try hard enough. And the consequences of that is that we constantly meet in rooms and talk about how do we get better. And we've been doing it for at least 50 years. And we will be doing it for the next 50 unless people change. And I don't want to be here in 50 years giving the same speech, although uh, I do recycle sometimes. So first of all, let me say that I'm pleased to be here uh, back at Monash, first here in 1960. I'm labelled a pioneer because uh, they think I've got enough money to donate to worthwhile causes. When you were here that long ago, you must have done something in your life. So the shoelaces on John Monash's uh, statue out there were contributed by me. Um, but it is good to be back. It, it still in many ways feels like home even though you have to search hard now for the buildings that were here at the time that I was here and the playing field where I used to roll in the mud um, and pretend we were playing football is no longer here and I do regret that. I think every student should be able to roll in red mud and then have to stand under a shower for half an hour to get rid of it um, even though I think it's embedded in the pores of my skin. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I do enjoy opportunities to speak like this, and I'm sorry if I go on a little too long. Um, but uh, it gives me an opportunity to reflect on matters that I think are important, and it gives me an opportunity to pontificate uh, on the direction of this country, my country, your country, uh, and its place in the world. I'm in a stage of my career where I haven't got much to lose. Um, they can't do much to me anymore, but uh, uh, I do have a bit of life's experience to draw on. And when I do uh, take the time to reflect, uh, I get anxious. I get anxious for a lot of reasons. But amongst them all, I come back to what I don't see. And what I don't see is the leadership that we need to secure our place in the world. Instead of political leaders, for example, I see the emergence of an opportunistic, self-styled ruling class with a vision that's invariably reduced to vote for us because we aren't them, a focus on keeping their own job rather than developing a comprehensive vision for the country alongside a narrative that explains to us what difficult choices will have to be made uh, and why. And then when business leaders uh, step in to comment on social or related issues like climate change, uh, they are told uh, fairly abruptly to stick to their knitting I heard a speech uh, just the other day from a junior, if boisterous minister in the present federal government. During his speech, he must have used the expression quiet Australians at least 20 times. While I wish that he was one of them by the midpoint of his speech, um, they clearly don't understand that when they leave a vacuum for long enough, it will be filled. People have to get on and do things, and people will want to do things. Personally, I think it's entirely appropriate that business leaders speak out about the nature of the society from which they draw their workforce, or the society back to which their workforce goes when they knock off, and indeed from which they draw their shareholders. If they aren't important matters for a business, I don't know what is. And I was heartened um, to re realise that I'm not alone. A survey of about 3,000 Australians and 59 uh, bosses uh, released last week uh, revealed that 78% of the general public supported corporate leaders speaking out on issues of public importance, even though 52% thought that when they were, they were doing so in the interests of their own company. We're allowed to be cynical in this country, but 
The point is that 78% thought that they should speak out. So Junior, the Junior Minister, was allowed out to attack companies that succumb to noisy elites, as he put it, which is probably all of us, and dare do or even say something that politicians will not. Then he came out the next day and to say that he wasn't doing what he clearly was. And when I say allowed out, I mean that. If that speech was not authorised by the Prime Minister's office, I would be stunned. In government, that's what they do. They get their speeches cleared and uh, maybe he used quiet Australians. We couldn't have used quiet Australians too often because uh, that's what they do. But there must have been something in it that they decided that they would um, uh, say that we misunderstood. But that's the way it is. Attack any messenger and tell the rest of us that you'll be right. No worries. Somebody will pay enough for our resources and buy enough of them so we can get income tax breaks even if they depend on price spikes due to accidents in other countries. But she'll be right and anyway the consequences won't be ours to manage. They are for the most part uh, for the next lot to worry about and between times by the way vote for us because we aren't them. So why are we so apparently willing to ride our luck? Why don't we prepare for the day when our resources will run out or when the market won't offer a price that sustains our prosperity? Is it because we never had to work hard to earn our prosperity, as a nation I'm talking about, not as individuals? Gold, wool, coal, vast acreage, ores, gas, all gave us a prosperity because we were lucky they were found and could be exploited at a time when other countries were prepared to pay a good price for them. As long ago as 1990, then Minister John Dawkins said, and I quote, the determinant of our success involves working better and smarter, scuttling mediocrity for quality and distinction. We cannot enter the next century rollicking on the sheep's back or creaking and swaying in some coal truck. Close enough to 30 years later, the whole generation later, the Monash University economist, Jacob Madsen, was quoted last week as saying that, I quote, R&D was a critical part of moving the economy away from the mining sector, which has led productivity gains and dominated exports while leaving Australia with few globally competitive technology firms. The Australian economy is far too under-diversified, deriving a large part of its foreign income from a few minerals and agricultural products. So they were both right, and still we quibble, still we argue, still we meet in rooms and saying we've got to get better. But it can be different if we want it to be. Now, I have a bunch of heroes in the USA. I'm not going to argue that they're as effective now as they would like to be, but they see it as part of a long game, and every long game has a beginning. Back in 1995, a bunch of American corporate leaders wrote an open letter to the then President Clinton. The letter included the following, and I quote, We take for granted technological breakthroughs that have made American society the most advanced in history. In a very real sense, they epitomise the American dream. But these breakthroughs didn't just happen. They are the products of a long-standing partnership that has, as a matter of national policy, fostered the discovery and development of new technologies. This partnership, the research and educational assets of American universities, the financial support of the federal government, and the real-world product development of industry has been a critical factor in maintaining the nation's technological leadership through much of the 20th century. Unfortunately, they said today, that is 1995, there is pressure for critical university research to be slashed. Remember, this is corporate leaders writing this. University research, they wrote, makes a tempting target because many people aren't aware of the critical role it plays. It can take years of intense research before technologies emerge that can make it in the marketplace. History has shown that it is federally sponsored research that provides the truly patient capital needed to carry out basic research and create an environment for the inspired risk taking that is essential to technological discovery. They got it right. We've known about it for centuries. Back in 1660, Robert Hooke, one of the founders of the Royal Society of London, uh, said that uh, scientific discoveries on motion, light, gravity, magnetism and the heavens would improve shipping, watches, optics and engines for trade and carriage. Now, I'll bet he didn't know about GPS. I bet he'd never heard of a smartphone. But somebody did later, and because of the basic science that had been done, and the environment that it created and the knowledge that it gave led to developments that we now all enjoy and indeed many of which we take simply for granted. 
Now, there are serious lessons in all that for us, uh, but we don't tend to look, we don't tend to learn, uh, and we don't tend to emulate, even if we have to Australianise from one culture, like American culture, to our own. Uh, what we do in Australia is talk primarily about impact, about translation, economic benefit, and fundamentally, who pays. And while we do that endlessly, the Americans have done it again. About 12 months ago, a group of nine industrialists in the US put out a statement called Innovation, an American Imperative. It was a call to action by American industry, higher education, science and engineering leaders, uh, urging Congress to enact policies and make investments that ensure the United States remains the global innovation leader. That statement includes the following. Our nation knows what it takes to innovate, a sustained commitment to scientific research, a world-class workforce, and an economic climate that rewards entrepreneurship and innovation. But, they said, our leadership is now at risk because of years of uh, under-prioritising federal scientific research investments and policies that promote innovation. They went on, now is not the time to rest on past success. As noted by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, they work better together there than they do here, uh, in its 2014 report, uh, Restoring the Foundation, the Vital Role of Research in Preserving the American Dream, they wrote, there is a deficit between what America is investing and what it should be investing to remain competitive, not only in research, but in innovation and job creation. If these trends continue, other countries will soon surpass the United States as the global innovation leader, and I won't give you more than one guess to guess which one they were particularly talking about. So they said we must heed the warnings of the past decade and act decisively. So they went on to make their points. In particular, they wrote Congress must renew the federal commitment to scientific discovery by ending the sequestrations, deep cuts to discretionary spending caps. What do we do in Australia? Figures released just last week show that gross expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP fell from 2.25% in 2008-9 to 1.79% in 2017-18. It's a lot of dollars. This is well below the OECD average, and remember the countries in the OECD, they're not all ones that we would say are like us, or at our stage of development, but the OECD average is 2.38%, and this latest round of figures marks the first time that Australia's investment has actually gone so far backwards. The latest figures on Commonwealth investment in science, research and innovation, the SRI tables, 2018-19, show that spending will be to the order of 1.7 billion lower this financial year in real terms compared to the peak in 2011-12. And the tables show that Australian government R&D investment as a percentage of GDP peaked in 2012 at 0.67% and it will, is now forecast to be 0.51% in uh, 2019. Business expenditure uh, let us down a bit. Um, business expenditure on R&D dropped by 12% between 2013-14 and uh, that's about $2.2 billion. It came back a little last year, so the net fall from the peak is $1.4 billion. So we've fallen down the table of um, R&D investment by government. Uh, we're now below Mexico, the Netherlands, and we're about to lose, get even further behind Europe, generally China, the US, South Korea and Japan. And the point is that what we've done is we've stifled risk-taking and investment in technology, according to business and, and, and economists, business leaders and economists. And you remember the statement in the 1995 American letter where they talked about the inspired, the, the research leading to inspired risk-taking, as I mentioned it earlier. And we've lost sight of that need and that link and that partnership indeed. Uh, university research in, is particularly important to Australia. Um, university total expenditure in 2017-18 was $11.23 billion, and of that, roughly 75% was in science, technology, engineering and maths. And the universities, together with the public research agencies such as CSIRO, employed more than 75% of the nation's researchers. One of the things that has intrigued me for a number of years is that business research and development was largely in-house, or the expenditure was largely in-house. Just roughly 0.4 billion of the identified 18 plus billion, 0.4 out of 18, was spent where 75% of the nation's researchers are. 
you would think that we would have to do better than that. You would think that we need a different notion of partnership in order to do better than that. Spend 18, spend 0.4 billion where 75% of the nation's researchers actually are. The, uh, our last major review of research funding and its architecture was around 2001 in the lead up to backing Australia's ability. Um, there was to be one, but, uh, which I would have done, but we voted the other way. It was time to do it, it's still time to do it. The second commitment they made, the Americans made, was to make permanent to strengthen federal R&D tax credit as part of the tax reforms to encourage more private sector innovation investment uh, here in America instead of in competitor countries. What do we do? We've got an R&D tax credit with an expenditure at around $3 billion in 2011-12. Uh, Since then, governments have sought to rein in spending for purely fiscal reasons. The then Treasurer Scott Morrison signalled a tougher line on uh, companies claiming credits when they had not produced significant innovation the previous year as the government prepared to move away from the former Prime Minister's Innovation Fund. Uh, the present Treasurer made it clear that the tax R&D incentive was not about providing tax breaks for companies to do what they will be doing anyway, but rather putting the right settings in place to enable them to go a step further and back themselves to grow. In general terms, I support that view. In my time uh, as Chief Scientist, I was lobbied by R&D managers for two main purposes. Um, one was to get more help, or three main purposes. One was to um, give them advantage. The second one was to remind me that the red tape around it made it too hard for small to medium enterprises, particularly to register. Uh, and the third point they made was that most of the money went back to the head office, uh, invariably overseas, and added to the bottom line and did not build much additional R&D capacity in Australia. On the first point, uh, I was surprised uh, by the small number of enterprises that actually registered their eligibility. All up around 15,000 companies register. Now, I know that many of our approximately 2 million enterprises in Australia do not do research, but it would have to be more than 0.75%, you'd hope, actually did research and development and there was a bucket of money and all you had to do was do research and the research was loosely defined and you got a tax break if you did and it got approved through a bureaucratic process. On the second point, um, there is uh, 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 something to note. Uh, I don't know how much business R&D there would be in Australia if the tax R&D system were changed to mean that it had to stay in Australia. That is what would happen if it had to be used to build on the present base rather than contribute to reducing the cost to the company of what is presently done here. And I don't know the answer to that and I don't know that anybody uh, does. The third thing the Americans did was to recommend improving student achievement in science, technology, engineering and maths through increased funding, etc. Our position is that um, the uh, uh, enrolments in STEM education and school have continued to decline. Um, there may be a little uptick in a couple of areas uh, now, but uh, very small by comparison with the decline that has occurred over the last 20 odd years. Um, that long term uh, decline is particularly in science and the challenging mathematics subjects and it has occurred, as I said, over a long period of time. And performance is either stagnating or in decline notwithstanding as many as 13 initiatives to try to improve it and uh, four initiatives aimed at encouraging STEM and early learning. There are green shoots in New South Wales particularly with science extension courses and an investigating science course for everybody, um, but uh, both are first rate and they should be national. Intriguingly, the US did something about it. Uh, back in Obama's year, he set a goal of 100,000 new STEM teachers by 2021 25,000 more engineering graduates per year um, compared to when he took office. And until very recently, I don't know what's happened in the last couple of years, but until very recently, they were well past halfway to meeting their target. So here there's lots of activity, lots of argument, little progress. There they tried to do something because they recognised the issue needed to be met. Reform US visa policy, well, we've reformed our visa policy in 2017. The Turnbull government announced the abolition and replacement of 457 visa program with a temporary skilled uh, shortage visa. The impact of the changes was to affect visa, uh, visas granted to scientists and technology professions quite profoundly. It was roundly criticised. 
Uh, they continue to do it, and the government has recently announced that their Global Talent Visa program would become permanent. As of August the 4th, only 30 visas had been granted under the program, and only 23 business organisations are approved participants. So again, it's one thing to complain about it. It's one thing to wring our hands and meet in a room like this in 50 years' time and say, gosh, look what happened. We've actually got to do something, and it's got to be in partnership, because if any one of us goes out there, the universities, the business, or indeed government, go out there, then they basically just get... You just get told, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Whereas, as the Americans show, it's much harder. And I'll finish off the American bit in a minute. Um, they talk about uh, taking steps to streamline uh, or eliminate costly and inefficient regulations and practices. Uh, we have uh, a view. We use a majority of red tape all the time. Uh, some, some regulations are actually important, like how you use plastics, um, how you use medicines, various things like that. Uh, but doubtless over time you accrete dross that should be got rid of and hopefully the review will do some of that. They reaffirm merit-based peer review as the primary mechanism that federal funding agencies should employ making competitive scientific research grants. If you don't think that's under threat in Australia, you're wrong. I chair a committee of the present government on the Barrier Reef. The Senate last week passed a motion to refer to a committee. All of the underpinning science that goes to the re uh, that underpins the regulations that have just been introduced by the Queensland Government to um, regulate runoff fertiliser and um, pesticide, herbicide, into the reef lagoon. Um, a, the Queensland LNP uh, uh, three weekends ago passed a resolution saying that all science that impacts on public should be referred to an independent audit. And when you think about one of the reasons why we exist, which is to provide the evidence base for public policy, to then say for purely political purposes that this should be sent off to, a, to an independent audit, indeed by the Auditor General, um, that somehow this is going to improve the uh, uh, science or the public policy. And I should say that a lot of this is driven by some shadowy groups, but they have one person who is an engineer, I believe, who is going around saying that the science is deeply flawed. It's been out there for 20 years, it's been peer reviewed, it's been reviewed and reviewed and reviewed, and there is no evidence that says it's wrong over 20 years, but somebody can see the flaw. And because of the political atmosphere at the moment, we're now going to get audits that proposed to get audits unless we do something about it. Uh, they talk about stimulating further improvements in adva advanced manufacturing, and we try to do that too. But all of the programs that we have of the, from the federal government are all terminating programs. So one of the really interesting things about government is that they have a good idea, they put some money in and they give it three years to run, and then regardless of whether it works, it may well get cut because of financial constraints further down the track. Now, the US statement uh, ended with, we the signatories urge support for these actions to keep the United States the global innovation leader, and we stand ready to do our part. That was signed by the chairman and CEO of John Deere, the chairman and president of Lockheed Martin, the um, CEO, co-chair of Restoring the Foundation, the chairman of the Royal Dutch Shell, the CEO of Microsoft, the CEO of North, Northrop Grumman, the CEO of Novartis, the CEO of National Association of Manufacturers and of Merck and Company, as well as the CEO of Boeing Company. And then there followed a list of 500 organisations, universities, corporations, uh, which endorsed that statement. So if you look at it on the web, it goes on forever because they're all there. Now, could we do something like that? Could we build a partnership that enabled us to bring the argument forward and enough of us to stay the race for long enough to be able to make it compelling? Now, it mightn't work in America, but because it does work or doesn't work, doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So could we do something like that? Not sure. In 2001, John Howard proposed to inject money into the research system through a program called Backing Australia's Ability. I, uh, I don't know what role I had at the time, but I had one. And um, I contacted a senior business figure 
and discussed with him the possibility of getting a few Australian corporate leaders to sign a similar letter to the one sent to President Clinton, 1995, primarily to give confidence to the Prime Minister that we were with him. It was going to be a letter of support. Anyway, he thought it was a good idea, but he got back to me two weeks later, a little disgruntled. He could not find one single Australian corporate leader to sign a letter supporting the actions that the Prime Minister was proposing to take. Not one. So it was timidity beyond belief. Uh, maybe in those days, business leaders would indeed more likely stick to their knitting. Um, I hope that the present crop, some of whom are now beginning to speak out on issues of importance to this country, that they might see it differently when the opportunity comes, and I hope it comes soon. The partnership notion so favoured by the US seems to be too difficult here, and it has to get better. Like any partnership, each player has to give a little. Business has to understand better the timelines of universities along with their capacities and their costs, and universities shouldn't oversell. Universities have to remember that they have a key role in Australia's development, not just through the education systems, but securing a future that positions us well as a nation in a hostile world. Another one of my US heroes, Derek Bock, who was president of Harvard, and he put it very clearly, I think, the division between pure and instrumental inquiry is much too sharp. It is possible to explore a subject out of a keen desire to understand it better and a belief that such an understanding may be of use to humankind. And that's not how we used to think in the universities. They were always two separate. And I know it's not here and you're here because it isn't like that here. But it has to be much more on a national scale if we're going to turn the big ship around. Government in their turn should look to the patient capital and be patient. It should also make sure that regulations are there for a purpose and not an impediment. Our risk-averse world, in our risk-averse world, in our risk-averse Australian world, that's a big ask. They could also add incentives for cooperation, such as recommendations that were included in the review of tax R&D. So we do have to bring business uh, needs together with um, where so many of the nation's researchers are, in the universities and the public agency. So we've got to do more of what we see here. We've got to get the message out and we can show through you that it can be done. Partnership is important, it's critically important and that's the message we have to get through and we've got to live the life. The best ones will be built on trust, shared values, shared principles and ethics and all of these can be accommodated and problem solved if there is a will. So I do hope we get better. I do hope that the recognition, US style, of the importance of business and their role and universities and their role are seen to be linked uh, for the future of the country. Because if we don't get it right, I don't think it's rosy. If we do get it right, it's a whole bunch of roses. Thank you.